continuing along in the Kuzari. Uh, we are on uh, page 157, but before we go there, I wanted to just review something 50 pages before then. Um, we're talking about the special quality of the land of Israel and how it is the only place in the world where a Jew has the ability to achieve perfection. We had used the analogies of the vine being planted in the proper soil with the proper cultivation. So you need three ingredients in order for there to be a spiritual perfection. You need to be Jewish, you need to be the proper vine. Genetically, you need to have those certain genetic qualities of a, per, of a perfect vine, of a properly cultivated vine. Number two, you need the proper soil, which is the land of Eretz Israel. And number two, you need the cultivation, the fertilization, and the, and the, the tutelage, which is the performance of various mitzvot and the presence of a temple in order for a Jew to achieve a spiritual perfection. Uh, before we embark on our discussion of Cain and Hevel in relation to the land of Eretz Israel, I want us to uh, observe that <clears throat> uh, back in Essay 1, uh, on page 107, when Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi had begun his discussion of, you know, Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi has this very uh, concretized view of the intrinsic value of the Jewish people and their intrinsic superiority, spiritual superiority over the rest of humanity. We pointed out that this is a very controversial uh, position to take because it almost implies a, a racial superiority and it's very, it can be very troublesome if it's misapplied. Um, but at the same time, Rabbi Yudha Levi is unequivocal about this matter. He's very, very clear that we inherited a certain kind of, for lack of a better term, a genetic quality that is unique to the Jewish people that allows us to achieve prophecy whereas no other nation is privy to that prophetic experience, that idea of uh, being unified or conjoining with the Almighty in this very, very intimate face-to-face -face experience. Um, and in the, in the course of describing how this started, all the way going back to Adam HaRishon, to the very first man, Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi had described that Adam was the perfect human being, the most perfect human being without any flaw, because he was, he was not created from a mother and father, he was created directly from God, and as a result he lacked any kind of genetic um, uh, flaw that we would normally find in, in any human being who is born from parents. He then talks about, on page 107, if you go to that bottom paragraph, uh, paragraph 3, he says, Adam had many children, but only one son, Hevel, was worthy of taking his place, since he closely resembled his father. Cain killed his brother Hevel because he was jealous of his superiority. God then replaced Hevel with Shase, Seth, who also resembled his father. Shes, then, was the elite son, the heart of the fruit. All others were like the peel. And then he goes on to say, Shes's elite descendant was Enosh, and so it went until Noah. In each generation, there were elite individuals who resembled Adam, and thus they were, thus they were also known as sons of God. Okay, so... That's really all I wanted us to see from the first essay. Now let's go to where we're holding in the second essay on page 157. And Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi continues his discussion of the superior quality of Eretz Yisrael. We pointed out that a person can only prophesy inside the land of Israel, or if he's outside the land of Israel, he could also prophesy providing that it's because of Eretz Yisrael. Either his prophecy pertains directly to Eretz Yisrael, or he is uh, uh, basking in some kind of afterglow that he had from having previously lived in Eretz Yisrael. So, for example, the prophets Yirmiyahu and Yechezkel, even though they were taken into captivity, still had the ability to prophesy because uh, they were living in Eretz Yisrael for so many years. Then he continues and he says, this is the land which is called in front of God. Like we quoted the Pasuk from last week. That God's eyes are constantly on the land of Israel. 
This is also borne out from the story of Cain and Hevel. It was on this land that jealousy and desire first arose between Cain and Hevel when they strove to find out which one of them was worthy of taking their father's place as the elite in heart. Now, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi has already revealed to us in the first essay that Cain did not have the proper disposition initially when he was born to be able to take his father's place. Hevel did, but Cain killed Hevel. The one chosen would inherit Eretz Yisrael and would attach himself to divinity, while the other brother would be as the peel of the fruit. And this is really just a continuation, but we're linking it to Eretz Yisrael. Before, Rabbi Yudha Levi had also expressed the idea that that is the very reason why Eretz Yisrael is, is from, a, uh, from a climate point of view, in a temperate area on the globe. It is not too hot. It's not too cold. It is because it represents the most perfect human being who is temperate, who is even keeled, who is not too hot, not too cold. And therefore, Eretz Yisrael represent, represents uh, from, a, from a climate standpoint, from a geographic stand, uh, standpoint, represents the, uh, the best place for to cultivate an individual who is going to be the inheritor of this uh, elite quality, this elite quality that has to be passed on to his descendants. Subsequently, Hevel was killed at the hand of his brother, making the position of Adam's successor vacant. Scripture then records that Cain left God's presence, meaning that he was driven out of Eretz Yisrael, where they had lived up until this time, and became a vagrant and a wanderer throughout the land. There's a lot of commentary to discuss what really the dispute between Cain and Hevel was. And I won't go into a, a, a longer exposition on, there are a number of different very interesting commentaries that talk about different qualities that Cain and Hevel possess, but I just want us to look at their names, Cain, Hevel, and Chase, in order to be able to gain an appreciation of what really is going on over here in the story. And I've mentioned, actually, we learned about this um, some time ago when we were learning Parshas Bullock, I, I touched on this as well. The, the name Cain comes from the word Kinyan. And as a matter of fact, the Torah records that the reason why Chava called Cain Cain was because she says, Kanisi ish es Hashem, because I have acquired a human being together with Hashem. So the idea of Kinyan is acquisition. Kinyan means I am something of substance. To be Kona something, to acquire something, to have something of substance that you've acquired gives a person, it implies a sense of self-importance. Hevel is just the opposite. Like Shlomo HaMelech writes in Koheles, Havel Havalim Amar Koheles. Hakol Havel. Everything is vanity. Everything is nothing. Hevel represents the opposite of Kayan. When we think about it, we notice that the two opposite traits are actually both a liability. Both of them are, are undesirable. Because when you're a, when you're a Kayan and you feel a sense of self-validation and a, a very healthy dose of ego, then you really are reluctant to share of yourself to others with others because you feel that everything that you have is extremely valuable. And that's why Kayan when he is called upon to offer, to give, bring an offering to Hashem, he does not bring of the best of his produce, of the best of his crops. Cain is a farmer, and yet he brings something that Chazal tell us he brought from his flax. He brings the less, least expensive of his produce as a farmer, because after all, what I have is of such value, I'm reluctant to part with it because I'm so important. He recognizes his own self-worth, and that in itself creates a liability that he's not able to, um, to nullify himself in the presence of Hashem. But it is that very same quality of ego that causes Cain to say that I am important <coughs> enough to be able to have a relationship with God. So on the one hand, he's reluctant to part with the best parts of his, of his crops, but at the same time, He's the one who initiates this whole relationship with God in the first place. He's the one who brings the carbon first and says, God, here I am. 
I'm, I'm a valuable person. I'm a valuable creation of yours in this world. And therefore, let's have a relationship. And he's the first one to bring a korban to Hashem. The Torah then records, Hevel hevi gamhu, mi becharos tzono umechel vehen. That Hevel follows Cain in suit. Now that's very characteristic of Hevel's personality. Hevel is the self-effacing, self-negating individual who feels that he doesn't have self-worth, doesn't have that sense of healthy ego. And therefore, he views himself as being unworthy, views himself as not even being worthy of a relationship with God. And therefore, the only reason that he brings a korban is that he sees his, gets his cue from his brother Cain. We notice in the story, Cain was the one who brought the korban first. And then it says, Hevel hevi gamu. And Hevel saw what Cain did. He said, oh, listen, well, you know, if, if Cain can do it, I guess that means that human beings have at least enough value to bring karbanos and try to relate to God in some personal way. But he brings from the firstborn of his flock and from their fat. Because he says, anything that I have, I certainly am not worthy of it, so I might as well give it back to Hashem. So you see, you have two extremes. You have the person who has extreme ego, and therefore says, of course, if anyone's worthy of bringing a korban to Hashem, it's got to be me. But at the same time, uh, what I have is so valuable because I made it after all. I grew it. I'm reluctant to part with the more expensive parts. Then you have the other extreme, which is Hevel, and he's the one who says, I'm not worthy. And as a result, only following Cain does he bring a karban, but he parts with that which is the, of greatest value to him because he's not worthy of it. He knows that it's, he's, by rights it's not his. So both extremes are un, are, have a good side and they have a bad side to them. But the way that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi had said it, that really originally God would have chosen Hevel to be the successor of Adam, because the meek shall inherit the earth, after all. And, and, um, and we know that humility is a very desirable trait because at least you're capable of completely subjugating yourself to Hashem and negating yourself in the presence of God. But there was one thing that Hevel lacked, and that was the sense of initiative, to be able to say that I at least have some level of value. So we go to the third son, and that's Shais. You look at Shais's name, and... Um, you look at his name and you see that he has the proper balance. Because what is the word shes? Anyone know what other words we can make out of the word sh shin, tough? Now, what, why did she call him? Why did Chava call her third son Shait? All right, wish me luck when I drink this mud. It's, it's, it's any good. That's what I'll do. Okay, it's drinkable. Okay. Um, why? Yes. You sowed. You sowed. Yeah. Kishatli Elokim Zera Acher Tachat Hevel Ki Haragot Kat Kain. God has placed for me. The word to be shotate is to place down on the ground. God placed for me on the ground another offspring um, in the place of Hevel because Cain had, had killed him. <clears throat> now, the word shotate is to create a foundation. What is the name of the foundation stone of the temple? Even Shdiya. Right? That is, there, there's a rock in the uh, Haram al Sharif, in the Dome of the Rock that protrudes from the ground. And we believe that that is the Evan Shetiyah, that is the foundation stone of the temple that goes down to the very core of the earth. That's our tradition. And it is also the foundation stone of the temple. It's called Evan Shetiyah. Shetiyah means the foundation. What is a foundation stone? A foundation stone is something that holds up the rest of the structure. It's there for the strongest stone that you can possibly find in your construction. But at the same time, it's the bottom. It's at the very bottom. So it possesses both qualities of a Kayan and a Hevel. It possesses the qualities of Kayan of being, of having the knowledge that I have strength, that I have value and worth, but also that I'm supposed to be on the bottom floor. I'm supposed to be the foundation. 
that is the proper, um, the proper balance that is finally created with the birth of Shays. And that is why he is deemed to be the proper heir of that elite gene of humanity that is going to be passed on eventually to Yaakov and all of his descendants. And when we look at various other places in the Torah, when we have this verb, sheis, found, we find that it is it fits into this. Because when Bilam actually blesses the, the Jewish people, he says, Vekarkar kol b'nei sheis, that there will be an end of finality to all of the sons of Seth. And why he chooses the sons of Seth um, is quite curious, but the, the, the truth is, is because the idea of a shes. Uh, if you have a Shess-like mentality, then you're capable of enduring until the end of all time. You have the humility to know that I'm purely just a foundation stone to hold up others, and I'm there to serve others, but I'm also quite strong. I have a, an, an inherent inner strength, an inner core that allows me to endure. And that's what, um, that what, was, that's what was needed in order to, be, to inherit the land of Eretz Israel. A great humility to know that I am not here because of myself. I am here for others. I'm here to serve Hashem. I'm here for my fellow human being. But at the same time, I know that I have great strength and great value so that I won't, I'm not going to let myself be pushed around. So that's a typical Israeli, right? <laughs> right? That's, what, that's the quality of, of Israelis today, right? No one's going to push me around, but at the same time, I'm not here to, to boast. I'm not boastful. I'm not prideful like those Americans, you know, but I, I, I feel that sense of, I feel that sense of, of worth at the same time. And, and, and so what is the rectification after Cain kills Havel? So Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi tells us the rectification is that Cain can no longer abide in the presence of Hashem. He has demonstrated that his, his inherent character is not capable of living in Eretz Yisrael and having that very intimate relationship with the Ribbon Shalom. And therefore, what, he gets a very fitting punishment. Navanad Tihiyabaretz, he'll be a wanderer in the land. Vayetze Kayin milifnei Hashem. The Kayin has to leave the presence of Hashem. He can no longer abide in Hashem's presence. And um, part of that punishment is to be able to rehabilitate Kayin to the greatest degree possible. Cain, because you had felt this great sense of ego, this great sense of value in yourself, becoming a wanderer, becoming a, a nova, not a vagrant and a wanderer, sort of detaches you from that sense of great value. Um, it, 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 it humbles you when you have to, you don't have a place that you can call your own home. Having a place where you can hang your hat and say, this is my home, gives you a greater sense of ego. When you, once you take that away from a person, then the person loses that, and that was part of Kayan's tshuva process. But the way the Rebbe Yudha Levi describes it, it also detaches him, it detaches Kayan from the place of prophecy, because, because he's demonstrated through his behavior that he's not capable of being the great inheritor of Eretz Yisrael uh, and of this very intimate relationship with Hashem. Any, uh, any questions or comments on Kayan and Hevel? You mentioned that Rabbi Huda Levi says that three things are needed. Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, and the Torah, right? Mm -hmm. According to Rabbi Huda Levi, are they all three of equal importance? It seems that way. He doesn't, they're all three, they're all three vital ingredients. What, how they're weighted, he doesn't really indicate. But it doesn't seem, but of what relevance is it? If you need all three ingredients, what difference does it make how they're weighted? I think it makes a big difference because, like Rav Sadigon said, Ain Uma Sein Uma Elaba Torah. You can have an Israel keeping the Torah, it doesn't have to be an Eretz Israel. I understand that all three are needed for the ultimate. This week I saw a flyer for Shabbat Aliyah here, and at the bottom it said it's sponsored by Mizrahi. Mizrahi uh, supports the Jewish people. Eretz Yisrael and the Torah, and it bothered me. To the Torah see was put last. Exactly. Yeah. Now I hear you. I hear you, Mr. Sochachevsky. It's an excellent point. I validate everything that you're saying. You can have a Jewish people, and you can have a Torah without Eretz Yisrael. 
but you can't have an Eretz Yisrael without the Jewish people and without Torah. I mean, take, take the perfect examples to look at the historical background of the Jewish people. When we left the land of Israel, it was desolate for thousands of years, but the Jewish people still flourished in Gullus because we had the Torah. So your point is well taken. But to be able to, to be able for the Jew to achieve the apex, perfection, he can only do it in Eretz Yisrael. But your point is very well taken. Also realize that the Ramban does sort of validate what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is saying as well. The Ramban says something very disturbing. He says that the only reason why we do mitzvot in Chutz La'aretz is to stay in practice for when we make Aliyah, which is a very jarring statement because it almost implies that it's like a practice run. Every time we do a mitzvah here, it doesn't really count. So it's very problematic to understand what the Ramban really means. Most of the commentaries say that he does, he's not meant to be taken literally. He's really quoting a medrash. The medrash says that when God sent the Jewish people into exile, it was like a divorce, that God divorced his wife. But he told his wife, his ex, or the wife that he was separating from, you know, uh, stay in practice, keep your jewelry on, keep putting on your cosmetics because one day I'll come and take you back and I want you to know how to stay pretty for me. <laughs> so that's why, that's why we still do mitzvot, he says, uh, in, in the Gola, in the, in the Golas. Um, anyway, okay, yes? Last week you were mentioning something about that Kaina have this kind of genetic of competition. They co competition, like they are com competitive all the time because they have this genetic, like the gene, from, from this competition. So I was wondering, what, so if this is the way, the way that you were saying, Rabbi, so Adam Arishon has this genetic also. So with who is trying to compete with Adam Arishon? Um. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if if, um, if I'm saying exactly what you what you said. I said that Cain and Hevel had this predisposition to to compete with each other because of the fact that their personalities were so opposite to each other, and it was really going to do, going to come down to which of these personality types was more desirable to Hashem. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi had told us 50 pages ago that if it was necessary to only choose between one of these two. Hevel would have been the, the more desirable option because of his humility, because of his negation of self. But as we point out, Shays, Seth, is an improvement over Hevel. Because whereas Hevel didn't have that self-worth, Shays at least saw himself as a foundation. But Adam is possessing both qualities. And that's why Shays really represents the, the true composite that was contained within Adam. Adam had both. Adam had ego, and he also had humility. When he had two children, it, it split into two, and it comes back together with, uh, with, with, with Shait, with Seth. Am I making myself clear? Yeah. OK. Yes? I'm thinking about the comment about Mizrahi. Um, it's, I think in Hebrew, perhaps it comes out a little differently. Okay? I think it's, um, I don't remember the exact quote from the beginning, but it's le, Am Yisrael bit Eretz Yisrael al pi Torah Yisrael. So it's not putting Torah last, it's stating a foundation that is really not an order. There's, there's nothing, I don't, okay. I, mean, I don't have to support them, right. I don't have to defend right. them. We don't have to do a Rashi on the flyer. Are, right. There are greater people, right. greater people yeah. than I who decided yes. it was a banner. Right. And I think it was not in order of importance at all. I, I, I think your point is very well taken as well. It's, um, it uh, sounds different when she says it in English. That's right. right. Yeah. right. And what yes. did they do in the English? They wrote, how did, what was it in English? They wrote, it said Mizrahi in support of the people of Israel, the state of Israel, corrupt Israel. So they have to do something with their English. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound different when you say it in Hebrew. Well, I'll keep Torah Israel gives them a and the Torah Yisrael, therefore, coming last is like acharon acharon chaviv, meaning that it's like everything, both the Jewish people and Eretz Yisrael, are based on the Torah of Yisrael. So that's why it comes up better. And everybody should come to the Halabamalkim. Yes, of course. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Rosenfeld. Yeah. 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 Okay. And on that note, let us go on.
uh, uh, scripture likewise states regarding Yonah, that Yonah arose to flee to Tarshish, away from God's presence. Now, Yonah too, that entire story of Yonah, and how he runs away from God when he's told to give a prophecy to the people of Nineveh that they have to do to show. There's a whole question in the Mephorshim why we read the story of Yonah on Yom Kippur. And, and indeed, this, this, there's a question in the commentaries. What is the lesson, or, or, or really, let me phrase it better, from whom in the story are we to gain the strongest lesson? Is the lesson to be gained from Yonah? Or is the lesson to be gained from the people of Nineveh? Or, I don't know, there are other characters in the, in the story. We, there's a fish in the story that we could gain a lesson from. You know, if you eat too much before Yom Kippur, you'll feel like you have to vomit something up, right? <laughs> but I, that, I say that in jest. But um, the story of Yonah, is, is a, is, there are multiple lessons, and depending upon the character that you subscribe to. But Yonah, for, for sure, was a person who sought to get away from Hashem's presence. Now, how could you get away from Hashem's presence if Mala Ahar it's Kivodo, if the whole world is filled with God's glory? The answer is, is that all he was seeking to do was to sever the prophetic bond that existed between himself and Hashem. And he knew that in order to do that, he could flee Eretz Yisrael. And so that's precisely what he did. Why he chose to go down to Tarshish, of all, of all places, uh, perhaps the word Tarshish itself is indicative of because Lehit Roshesh, what does Lehit Roshesh mean? To become, would, poor. to become poor. And where did he leave, what port did he leave from in Eretz Yisrael? Yafo, which represents the great beauty of Eretz Yisrael. So his, his own acknowledgement, which is recorded in the story, is that Yonah himself acknowledged that by departing Eretz Yisrael, he was leaving the Yafo the great beauty of Eretz Yisrael and the great spiritual glory of Eretz Yisrael, to go to Tarshish, to go to a place of hit of, of, of uh, squalor, of poverty. And he knew that, and he voluntarily consigned himself to do that because he felt that it was the wrong thing to do to bring a prophecy to the people of Nineveh to do tshuva. Now, why did, Nin, why did Yonah not want to fulfill his proxy ship? So they, they say, the Mephorshim explain that you learn the great martyrdom from Yonah. Because Yonah had such a great love for Am Yisrael, for the Jewish people, that he was willing to martyr himself in the process for the Jewish people. Because Yonah saw prophetically that the people of Nineveh, if they would do tshuva, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And it was from Nineveh that the Jewish people would be attacked during the First Temple period and they would eventually exile the ten tribes. Forty years after the people of Nineveh did tshuva, that's precisely what happened, they went to war with the Jewish people, and the only reason why Hashem wanted the people of Nineveh to do tshuva, according to the Medrash, is because God knew that the Assyrians were predestined to take Jewish people as captives and to defeat the Jewish people in war. And Hashem says it is not fitting for an evil people to rise to such exalted status, to be able to trump the Jewish people. So in order for them to have at least some modicum of merit, in order to be known as those who are the defeaters and victors of the Jews, they have to be able to do tshuva. Yonah sees this, he sees this prophetically, and he doesn't want to be the harbinger of the Jewish people's defeat. And so he therefore runs away from Hashem, realizing that he's mitroshesh, realizing that he's fleeing to Tarshish, and will eventually suffer his own great fall from God in the process. But he says, I would rather sever my ties with the Ribbon Shalom and lose my own chelak in olam haba, and my own connection to God, if it means that I can delay the destruction of the Jewish people. So you learn tremendous martyrdom from Yonah, that even if you know, you know, they say a story <coughs> about great tzaddikim who were willing to give up their own portion, their own chilek in olam haba, in order to be able to help someone else. If someone came to you and said, would you be willing to give up your portion in olam haba to save someone else? 
So that's a very, very high level. It's a very, very lofty madrega to be able to accomplish. Your chilek and olam haba is your eternal lot. And yet Yonah was willing to do that. Yonah was willing to say, it's not about me. I'm going to go to Tarshish and let the Jewish people be saved. Okay, let us go on. Um, Adam's son Shes was born with the likeness of his father, as it says, and he begot in his likeness and his image. So as we explained, that, uh, that Shes was the most resemblant to his father. He thereby replaced Hevel as the elite descendant, as it says, for God has appointed Kishatli to me another child in place of Hevel. He was therefore worthy of being called the son of God, just as Adam was. He also merited Eretz Yisrael, which is one level below the Garden of Eden. And as we point out in the footnote from the, from the Kol Yaakov, that that's precisely why Adam HaRishon was placed in Eretz Yisrael immediately upon his ejection from the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was this um, very, very uh, lofty spiritual place. Once Adam demonstrated that he could no longer live in this place of ultimate Kedusha, uh, that was uh, otherworldly, Hashem places him in the place in this world which is closest to Gan Eden, which is Eretz Yisrael, and on, a, on a spiritual plane. Uh, so all of this discussion of Eretz Yisrael today should certainly give us pause to consider what is happening in Eretz Yisrael today, and certainly to daven on behalf of uh, the people of Yerushalayim and the people of all of Eretz Yisrael, that God should keep them safe. Uh, free from harm, and, uh, and that uh, Hashem should uh, uh, squelch all of our enemies' attempts to harm our people. Um, so I think we'll hold it here for today in the Kuzari. We'll talk next week, we'll talk about Yitzchak and Yishmael, Yaakov and Esav, very apropos to the Torah portions that we read.